Hi, my name is Brendan Barrett and I'm a professor at Osaka University. Um, today I'm going to talk about the, a new book that I've just published with my colleagues Ralph Horn and, uh, and John Fain of RMIT University. I'd also like to thank Marco Amati for giving me this opportunity to speak to you uh, about this topic. So my presentation today will be divided into three parts, and I hope that you'll find it very relevant to your work on strategic uh, planning issues. So the first part is actually um, discussing the ethical city within the context of um, contemporary politics, particularly neoliberalism. And then part two goes on to look at various disruptive forces that are going to are currently impacting but are going to continue to impact on urban forms activities over the next few decades and then i'm going to finish off in part three by contrasting the notion of the ethical city and the livable city as you know um, rmit research has done a lot of work on the notion of livability and Melbourne has been identified as one of the most livable cities. So it's very interesting to sort of compare uh, those two, two sets of ideas. So beginning with this idea of ethical city within the context of neoliberalism, I should say, actually, I've spent most of my time, my professional career um, in Japan. And there's actually very limited discussion here about what is neoliberalism and what kind of impact has it had on the world. It was only actually when I went to Australia in 2016 that I um, just came across, you know, academics who sort of constantly refer to neoliberalism, almost always identifying neoliberalism as, as the problem behind many, uh, you know, underpinning many of the issues that we face in today. I was a bit curious by that because the feeling I have just reflecting upon it a little bit is that, you know, we're all pretty much good uh, little neoliberals now, just like you know, people who um, were living in the former Soviet Union were, were communists. So we've, we've really sort of uh, followed the philosophy of neoliberalism. We've been in, you know, integrated it with our way of working and living. And um, it's kind of normal way of, seeing the world, at least in the last few decades. And um, our book really starts by discussing what that means and um, the potential it has to sort of limit our thinking uh, about different possibilities. So here's the, the basic structure of the book. I'm not going to go um, over all those different chapters, but, um, and you can, I really encourage you to to track it down via the library. So why ethics? Why an ethical city? Well, I think the really most important point is asking ourselves, you know, what is right? What is fair? What is just? What is good? On a, on a regular, a constant basis. Um, so really, you know, what ought we do? What is the right thing to do? Rather than what's just acceptable or what's expedient. And you know, once you start to think in those terms, we, we talk about the idea of having an ethical lens. Once you start to have an ethical lens, then you begin to see the world very differently. And you, you begin to ask yourself, why do we allow these things to continue? You know, for instance, homelessness. Why do we accept uh, high levels of homelessness in our cities? Or we walk past somebody begging on the street and we just kind of think, oh, that's normal. Yeah, but, it, but why? Why do we allow that to happen? And I think it's when the ethical lens, when you adopt an ethical lens, you start to question much more. The other really important point, and this was something that was made at a recent book launch we, we held, um, hosted by RMIT University, and Professor uh, Wendy Steele, who you, who you may know, she really emphasized this importance of the ethics of care. And she put it within the context of the Anthropocene. And as you know, the Anthropocene is this new age that we find ourselves in, where we as humans have a major impact on the workings of the world, the climate, the biosphere. 
um, and our oceans, etc. And in, because we are highly urban now, we're kind of losing our connections to, to the natural world. So when we talk about the ethics of care, we're talking about beyond human, that for other species as well. So it's not primarily an urban idea, but it's certainly about, it certainly works uh, very effectively to adopt the ethics of care within an urban context, but let's also think about other species. And um, I'm particularly was influenced, I've been influenced by the, the writing of Mark Fisher. Um, sadly, um, he, he passed away. He actually committed suicide at one point, but his book, um, Capital Realism, is a really interesting um, viewpoint on our predicament. And he actually sort of says the situation is that we tend to view reality within the, uh, the within capitalism. So, you know, if you try to make a recommendation to change it, then the response is, um, well, be realistic. This is how things work. So your ideas are either outdated or impractical. And he also made the point that sort of um, neoliberalism has really eliminated this sort of category of value in an, in an ethical sense. So everything is kind of seen in an, in an economic sense. You know, how is this going to benefit businesses and less so from an ethics point of view? And I really recommend his work. Um, another interesting uh, book that we, we looked at was actually by Peter Bloom, and he talks, and then actually Ralph Horn and I had a really interesting discussion at the beginning uh, of the book because I began to talk about the idea of sort of ethical leadership and um, Ralph was sort of pushing back and he said, actually, you know what, we should be balancing this idea of the sort of the individual and the leader with um, notions of collective, collectivist responses and, um, you know, Bloom really captures this because what he says is that neoliberalism, what it's really done very effectively is sort of made us responsible for the, the negative consequences of neoliberalism. So, you know, it's our job to recycle. It's our job to reduce our carbon footprint and so on. And what it's taken away is this notion of society responding or systemic responses. I know the environmental groups push back on that, but it's certainly everywhere, almost everywhere else you look, it's you as the individual who has to um, do, take action to cure the ills caused by this uh, current malfunctioning of the economic system. And uh, yeah, I think that we really need to redress that somehow with um, collectivist responses. And then the third, very influential thinker is Wendy Brown. I, I totally recommend um, her writing. Uh, this, is, this is a fantastic book. It's pretty heavy, but what she's saying is that she actually describes uh, near, um, neoliberalism, uh, well, popularism, popularist politics as the Frankenstein monster that neoliberalism created. But she also goes on to sort of describe how neoliberalism has dismantled the sort of society and and defront politics so that you know we're very very cynical now about how uh, democratic pol politics works whether representative uh, democracy is actually functioning properly so such that we're contesting uh, elections and considering them to be fake and so on and this is all tied into neoliberalism and um, the individual freedom being paramount um, and uh, sort of, it's kind of going to, to an extreme now. And we're seeing that sort of kind of dysfunctionalism appearing as a consequence of that. So within the urban sphere, there's been a, quite a lot written about the notion of the neoliberal city. And actually it was David Harvey, I think, that really caught captured this quite concisely in her paper he wrote back in 2007 called Neoliberalism in the City. And he gave sort of three examples of what are the principles of a, a neoliberal city. First is that the city is sold as a tourist destination. Well, think about that in the context of Melbourne, very much uh, an emphasis on attracting tourists. And we're now noticing in 
the sort of COVID era, a, a reconsider consideration of that. Should we have these really high levels of tourism? Venice is, is another good example where um, you know, cruise ships were coming into this, the city and uh, highly disruptive, high levels of tourist activity. New Zealand, for instance, is now thinking about whether um, local economies should be redesigned so that they're not so dependent on high levels of tourism. But you know, this is essentially a neoliberal concept. The other uh, idea is that cities should be primarily uh, creating a good business climate. So it's not so much about how how is it what's it like to live there what's the lived experience it's more how can we attract businesses how can we innovate how can we be entrepreneurial how can we create this perfect climate for more business activity well you can understand that that makes sense because we need jobs but it sh it should it be the paramount one of the paramount drivers and then the third one is that um cities only want corporations and people that can afford to be there so these cities are wonderful, highly livable. Um, if they, uh, if you're super rich, if you have if you have enough money to enjoy that, if you don't, then it's unaffordable, and there are consequences for that. I think this is really captured quite well in um, Anna Minton's book. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to to read it. I came across it one time when I was visiting London. And it's a best it's a bestseller there. But what Anna Minton really does is that she explains how London has been transformed by um, the influx of very wealthy people, the super rich from around the world, who have um, kind of taken over quite large quarters of the city and uh, through property development and the purchase of, purchase of good uh, prime real estate, so to speak, they've actually ended up forcing a lot of people who can't afford those uh, high level of rents out of the center of the city. And this is also supported by um, this other book here um, on the Alpha City, which I um, complements Minton's work. And so you see a lot of academics now are kind of turning their attention to, you know, um, what's going on with regards to, to London and uh, who is, who's, who's mo moving in, who's moving out, how is uh, money influencing that? And, and, you know, Roland Atkinson's work is also really interesting and I recommend you take a look at it. So, you know, again, the notion of these super rich or the alpha elite impacting on the actual structure of the city. And let me see, this is captured actually in this, um, this article by The Economist uh, from 2013 called The Great Inversion. And what they actually show is how um, large parts of the center of London uh, are gentrifying. And uh, so that's those, those, those red areas are going up market. And then the uh, people who previously lived there, so for instance, there were quite a large number of uh, council housing areas built in the center of London in the post-war period. And what's actually happened is that many of the local governments have sold those off um, to private developers who then develop sort of prestige apartments for uh, high income earners and so on. And so those people who are, well, you might describe them as essential workers, they are finding that they have to relocate further and further out of the city, having a, a, a long, Commute, so it's a sort of transformation that's that's going on, and these red areas are, um, you know, alpha territories is a term that's being used now commonly to describe them, um, and in some instances they are sort of um, they're they're basically deserted in the evening. There's no life going on there. It's it's often you know held by people who are from outside of London who are investing in there and don't necessarily live there. They come at the weekend. Uh, to enjoy the London uh, London life, so very interesting and and quite a worrying trend that's happened um, in London, but it's also mirrored in other parts of the world as well. The thing is, and this is the very curious part, we are having lots of lots of people writing very interesting books like Ethical Cities, but um, you know I think um, if you I recommend you take a look at. Uh, Tim Jackson's post-growth, Life After Capitalism. 
um, we know this current system's not functioning properly and it's not really delivering for everybody, it's delivering for a very small segment of society. But we are currently at the stage where we've, we have a lot of ideas, but we don't tend not to know how to describe those ideas. We've basically post-capitalism, um, post-growth, uh, post-neoliberalism, but there isn't a term that's used to say, well, this is the new uh, era that we are, we've entered. And I think that's really cu a curious situation. And um, so you've got a, a lot of literature that's appearing. Now we've played around a little bit. Um, what we tried to do was contrast yeah, you know, here's neoliberalism, and when we when we talked about neoliberalism, we were actually referring to the work of Anthony Giddens, and he, from his book Third Way, and he basically described, uh, summarized what neoliberalism is all about, and as you can see here in the, in this slide, and then we tried to contrast it with what we the term we used was ethical realism. Actually, ethical realism is used in another context around. Um, sort of interventionist um, international politics from the US perspective, but we want to re re try and recapture or redefine that term. But anyway, as you can see, in, on the one side, um, neoliberalism is about things like minimal govern government. Um, it's about market fundamentalism. It's about moral authoritarianism and indi economic individualism. It's something I, I talked about earlier. It sort of accepts that inequality is just part of how society works. Um, within the UK context, there's a welfare state is a social safety net, but in other parts of the world, it doesn't have that function. In Latin America, for instance, the, the social safety net is almost missing. And um, so it sees modernization as a linear process and lacks an ecological consciousness and has this realistic theory of the, how the international order works. Now you could say that's sort of breaking down a little bit, but anyway, that's how we understand neoliberalism. On the other side, ethical realism, which we are talking about, has this notion of emancipatory politics. It su suggests we should experiment more with how democracy and civ civil society and public engagement works, and that we should also um, at respect the, the will of the people. That's very co controversial within the context of say something like Brexit and referendums and so on. But I think this is really important that we do respect the will of the people that we see, uh, we take into consideration networks of stakeholders and actors and that we emphasize not just individualism, but, but uh, collective agency. It's got to be low carbon. Um, and we also want to talk about how wealth works and how we understand prosperity. So we're looking at things like universal basic income, community wealth uh, building and so on and so forth. So that inequality is not accepted, it's addressed. And so we really think about, okay, cities should try to uh, completely reduce and eliminate um, inequality and persistent poverty. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by redirecting the flows, redistributing uh, wealth. And that we see modernization not as a linear, but as a, as a series of disruptions, that we need to have a high, high ecological consciousness. And then um, also we need to see the feminization of the state of politics and how, how we do things in general. So that's... Um, our understanding of ethical realism and how it contrasts with uh, neoliberalism. But um, there are some, some pitfalls that people have pointed to um, in our work, and I want to share them with you. The first is this um, slippery slope fa fallacy. So in, in many instances, we've sort of implied that cities that don't adopt this more ethic ethical stance they're on, the, they're on a slippery slope. Gradually, the situation will get worse and worse for them. And then um, we kind of give, present this idea, well, if you do go to a, in an ethical direction, then you have this virtuous cycle of people acting better and better. Um, 
as uh, you know they do the right thing and it spreads and you get this atmosphere where everybody wants to do the right thing and i'm not sh quite sure that that's um fully captures uh, what we we want to say we realize that there isn't one slip downward slope or one virtuous cycle going up but we think that it's important to insert an ethical dimension into what we try to do just to reconfigure things to shift balances uh, to alter power structures and so on the other um potential pitfall is this straw straw man argument and that's sort of based on the assumption that there's an alternative to capitalism and ne neoliberalism and um and then you know as i've mentioned earlier we've not really elaborated even though there's all these books out there talking about post-capitalism we've not really elaborated what the alternatives are in in a fully convincing manner and so in in, sen in a sense it's actually a question for ourselves is um, can we have a uh, you know better quality urban life uh, within the current global capitalist political economy? Is that feasible, or are we talking about an absolute radical transformation? And with that question, I will end this first part of my talk.